All right, time for a video about writing with some sound in it. Um, as you may have noticed if you're following along, I've been making a bunch of videos about writing on this imper an imperishable Wonderland of Infinite Fun project. I won't call it a book because I think it's bigger scale than a book. It's not necessarily the form of a book either, uh, although books will be involved assuming you know I make progress like multiple books should come out of the project but not just books anyway so I'm thinking of that as a much larger scale project that will take a very long time I mean maybe that something I work on for decades if you know if I'm fortunate we'll see uh, but in any case I've been making a bunch of videos silent videos really I say the writing videos, mostly like pre-writing type things, still getting set up. And there's some good and bad things about silent videos. The The bad part of it is, well, you know, they're silent and you can't hear all my thoughts. If you haven't seen the videos or you can't see the videos, what I'm doing is, you know, putting little post-it notes um, in the video and usually have a clock because I try to, I'm trying to keep it to 30 minute writing sessions. At least that's what I have been doing. So I would do multiple 30 minute writing sessions. That's for a few reasons. One reason actually is that if I record these videos, it takes a while to process the video. So it takes at least as long on my laptop to process a video, to upload it, even without sound, as it does to record it. So if I record a 30 minute video, that's going to take at least 30 minutes of my CPU maxed out, my laptop basically unusable for anything else, fans going full speed. Um, that's one reason. Another is, you know, I still am trying, I'm still trying to do the three videos a day. Um, I think 30 minutes of writing is a big enough chunk that that constitutes a video. Um, like if I were to write for four hours straight, which I don't plan to right now, in some sense that shouldn't count as one video. Um, I'm not trying to do least publishable units. I think the other thing is like I, after half an hour, I'm generally ready for a break. And I would, even if I were doing a four hour writing session, I would take a break periodically. I'd go get a drink of water or I'd go to the bathroom or something like that, or just walk around pace and think, or lay down on the couch and think or something. So you know, a four hour writing session for me would still be broken up into smaller pieces. Maybe I'd sit down and, you know, read a book for a few minutes. Um, so I think that's part of it. That's why those videos are 30 minutes. So anyway, I usually have a clock in the lower right, it's at the 30 minutes. And then the upper right, I just have like a note saying that this is a silent writing video. And then, you know, maybe I'll say a little bit about what I'm doing. You know, I've just been doing pre-writing. I've also started a writing journal which is checked into GitHub, because everything I'm doing on those videos ultimately gets checked into GitHub for my um, repo for this project. So even if you don't watch the videos, um, then you, know, you can just kind of see what I'm doing on GitHub. Um, so there are some, some good things about the silent writing, I think, and those silent videos from my perspective, maybe not from people watching it, but from, from my perspective, first of all, it helps me concentrate on the writing because I noticed before, you know, it is true. I was trying to psych myself up to write and I was reading all these books on writing and writing quickly. And I kind of got down the rabbit hole of playing around with keyboards and learning Dvorak and split keyboards and, you know, having a starter book, which I think in hindsight was, it was good to get me started, but was ultimately not the right way. Um, and you know, probably that was all a useful exercise because I was worried about my wrists. Um, and you know, I didn't want to blow them out any more than they are. Uh, so it made me think hard about what's causing wrist pain. And I got the wrist support, things for my hands and which have actually helped uh all those things so you know it was part of me getting psyched up that's good but I didn't feel like I was making any progress um you know felt like I was like yeah learning how to very slowly type at two words a minute or something like some sentences for a book I didn't care about 
It's not that I didn't care about it, but it didn't feel like that was the book I had to write. But it got me to think hard about what I actually wanted to write, which was the important thing. Um, for the silent videos, though, there's just not a whole lot of me talking, right, and justifying what I'm doing or explaining what I'm doing. I've got, like, the little Post-it note, virtual Post-it note thing where I just say generally what I'm doing, and then, you know, I, I just write or pre-write right now. Uh, so so I, I find it much easier to concentrate. Also, I think it's, it is really hard to explain something while you're doing it while maintaining a high level of concentration. And I see this with StarCraft players. I see StarCraft players who are playing on ladder and they're streaming and they're trying to explain what they're doing. And they almost always are playing terribly. And then well, once it gets hard... You know, unless they're way better than that other player. But if they're playing someone who's as good as them, you'll notice that they, they stop talking. You know, the, when the game starts really going, they're going to stop talking probably. Or they'll only say a few comments because it just requires all of their attention. And I found that trying to explain what I was doing while I was trying to write at some point was just a distraction. So I think that part's good. There's another part which hadn't really thought of, but probably in hindsight makes sense, which is right now, you know, I've got this nice setup with this, you know, fancy desk that can, this adjustable height and, you know, the, the laptop stand and the split keyboard that's all fancy and this fancy microphone, all these things, and the fancy trackpad and the fancy vertical mouse and the fancy chair. Uh, but... <laughs> Where do I actually write? I actually write laying down on my bed. Yeah. Okay. So that's where I actually have been recording almost all these videos. It's just me laying down on my bed, you know, like face down, got a pillow. I'm very comfy and I'm typing, you know, sort of the worst possible way where my hands are. Well, in some sense, it's okay because my hands are, my arms are like at a 45 degree angle because I can type in this kind of weird way. That I've learned how to type on the laptop on my bed. That's not too stressful on my hands. Actually, I feel less stress in my hands than when I'm using the fancy keyboard uh, sitting at my desk. Um, so for whatever reason, and if I'm feeling some pain, I'll just wear those wrist guards. Uh, but, but the main thing is I can type relatively quickly and... I can make progress and it's comfy enough where I can go for 30 minutes without a problem. Um, so that's the thing. It's like, I don't feel like I have to relearn how to type again, or I don't have to be in an uncomfortable position. So that I'm close to the microphone or I can use the fancy keyboard. I can just like, yeah, I don't know, sit down the most comfortable way or lay down the most comfortable way. I even did one session. I recorded it on the couch laying down. Yeah, that one's not very ergonomic. Laying on my back on the couch. That's probably not that's probably not a good one. My my wrists do usually hurt after I've done that. Um but anyway, that's one of the good things is, for me is I can just get in a comfortable position and write and, or pre write or whatever. And uh you know, I actually do it. I do it. It's comfortable, no problem. Just get some water. Good to go. So that's uh, the good thing is I'm actually working on it, and then I can record videos that way. And also I can do it any time of night or day. I can do it early in the morning, late at night. I don't have to worry about anyone else. I don't have to worry about making noise. I don't have to worry if there's noise in the environment. I don't have to worry if there's a dump truck going by, any of that stuff, or if someone's playing music loud, or someone's outside yelling obscenities sometimes happens. Okay, so where where am I with my writing? Well, right now I'd say I'm really doing pre-writing and the next stage of that is curation. So the type of the first stage of pre-writing was trying to figure out, okay, what do I want to do roughly? What is this project? Committing publicly to doing this project. You know, I keep changing my mind, so I guess I'm publicly changing my mind as well. Uh, but like I've said, I've been thinking at least since last summer 
of doing this imperishable wonderland of infinite fun or an imperishable wonderland of infinite fun project. So it's not like I haven't thought about it. It's more like yeah, I had to screw up the nerves to, to go for it. So that was the first stage of pre-writing was just getting in that mindset and working up the courage and saying, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I, I care about this. The next phrase, uh, phase of pre-writing was you know, trying to figure out what is some minimal infrastructure. And I started with LaTeX and you know, I think LaTeX has some issues. So right now I'm going with uh, Markdown and was it Pandoc or whatever? Yeah, I don't really care right this second. I'll probably end up doing some things in a couple different formats. That's not, I just don't want to get stuck on it. That's the main thing. Now the phase of pre-writing I'm at is really about uh, collecting collecting all the topics that I might want to discuss in this project. Uh, and that's a, a bigger project, mini project on its own than I had thought. I mean, I guess it shouldn't be a surprise because I've been doing this stuff for about 20 years now. And lots of collaborators have been working on things as well. And my, you know, my laptop is full of not even repositories, just directories where I've tried things out. In fact, I've got laptops going back 20 years and hard drives of backups going 20 years for projects that, you know, I've probably forgotten about, probably forgot about 15 years ago, but they're there because uh, I know that this laptop doesn't have all my projects that I've started. So just trying to go through and record, here are things that I know about, here are things that are interesting. If I were to write an exhaustive treatment about relational programming, here are things I would might include. Um, so that's just a big list. And then things like going through my pro uh, public GitHub repos. Well, it turns out I have quite a few. Going through my private repos, because I have private GitHub repos, I have private Bitbucket repos, had a lot of those. And then I have a whole bunch of things just on my laptop that I haven't checked in or they're shared from other people, um, collecting those. And for a lot of the private things, you know, there's a reason they're private. Maybe there's a, an unpublished collaboration with uh, another academic and that they might want to publish on it. Uh, or maybe another academic shared something with me that um, they might want to publish on in the future. So, you know, I want to be careful to not share anything that they wouldn't want me to share. For some of those things, I might ask people, it's like, is it okay to share? But for some of those, I'm just not going to share them. But I still wanted to see what was there because even though I'm not going to share a repo necessarily, I might um, you know, more generally talk about some ideas that I think are important. I might jog my thinking about some ideas that that aren't really private, um, but that, that repo helped me think about or reminded me of. And then the next stage, which I think I'm getting to this point, is to start doing curation. Um, so I've got got all these notes and uh, a couple files right now, sort of two main files, one that's public and one that, in the GitHub repo, and then one that's private for all the private stuff I've seen. Um, and I guess, you know, technically I should probably copy over from the private notes whatever I can to the public notes that I think is okay to share. Because I do have some things that clearly I could share. So maybe I'll do that first. And then there's this curation step, um, which I think is tied to the writing in some real extent, real, real sense, which is, okay, so now I have a list of, say, 300 topics or 500 topics and repos and links and things like that. Now, which of these do I want to talk about? Which of these, or which of these do I want to explore more? You know, if I wanted to, uh, and not, not everything I've found are things that I'd want to do deep dive on, but every once in a while I was like, oh yeah, here's, here's this uh, big repository that contains, you know, five sub projects or something like that. And there are interesting things here. Um, so I might go back. Um, but I was also thinking about, you know, this quote by David McCullough, the great writer, 
or for American history, he said there's so uh, such a thing as too much patience. I saw an interview with him where he said that such a thing as too much patience. So um, I've been watching some film courage interviews with Dr. Ken Achidi and you know, he's talking about similar sorts of things, which is, you know, eventually you just have to start working on something or there, otherwise I'll never get done. So, uh, he say, says it far more eloquently than I do. Uh, but you know, I, I just want to be careful that I'm not spending so much time pre-writing and curating things that I'm using it as an excuse to not actually start working on the writing. Um, because that's happened before. At the same time, like I said, this is a big project in my mind. So there is a lot, you know, there is 20 years of material. And I found when I wrote my dissertation, you know, that was 2009. That was uh, quite a while, while ago. Even writing my dissertation it was a little overwhelming to organize things. So um, I spent a lot of time outlining. I spent a whole week, as I recall, my memory's fuzzy about these things, but I think I remember spending a whole week, like 40, 50 hours, just working on an outline, the basic outline of structure. Um, and I, I think that ultimately helped me organize those ideas. So... You know, had I skipped that, I th I did skip it initially. I tried to do another approach, and I I didn't make much progress. So, you know, there's this tension of I want to start writing for real, I want to start getting things down, and then there's also well, there's 20 years of ideas here. How are they connected? You know, may I need a a detailed outline and so forth. So, um, but I I'm starting to feel the pressure internally where I wa want to start writing. No one's giving me pressure externally. No one cares, right? I mean, I mean, theoretically, people might want to read about these things, but it's not like someone's saying, hey, you need to start writing. The pressure is all internal, knowing how I've had issues in the past. Now, what I will say is that going back through all my private repos in particular, but also public repos, in some sense, my starting books and then stopping may not be as quite as bad as I've built up in my head because with one or maybe two exceptions, as far as I can tell, every time I started a book and abandoned it, I abandoned it within a week or two. So I'd start it, often I'd abandon it after a day or after four hours or something like that. Yeah, it's not really right. Let me try something else. Um, there's one project where it seems like I worked on it for a few weeks and then abandoned it. And then there was the, this Alpine, uh, relational programming, Alpine programming, uh, Alpine style book that I did work on that one for a number of months. And I was waking up early every morning, um, writing on it. So that's the, the only project where I did a sustained effort for, uh, multiple months really working on it. And I failed to complete it. And, you know, I did a lot of infrastructure work and, and so forth. I think too much infrastructure. That's what I'm trying to avoid this time. Um, but, you know, writing a bunch of scheme code for infrastructure to run tests before I start writing a word of the book, well, maybe that's premature, premature but I don't know that, you know, going through and trying to organize my thoughts and topics. I don't know if that's premature. That that just seems like a reasonable idea. Seems like a good idea to some extent, at least doing a first pass. So anyway, that's that's something I'm going back and forth. You know, there's there's this completionist, perfectionist part of me that wants to completely curate every single thing I've ever experienced you know, come across or every idea I've had or, or people have shared with me or that I've read about with about constraint logic programming or relational programming. Um, I don't think that's good for me. If I wanted to be a Donald Knuth, maybe that'd be great. If I wanted to spend all my time, you know, reading papers about constraint logic programming and then sort of 
um, trying to summarize the ideas and concepts and trends, then that'd be great. But that, then I'd be a different sort of person. I would be a, a, a scholar uh, instead of like an enthusiast. That uh, was probably the way I'd describe it. Like I think of Donald Knuth as a scholar in the old scholastic sense. You know, he's almost like a monk reading thousands of papers and digesting it and thinking about it really hard and often inventing technology himself or building on the algorithms. And then out comes this remarkable work of scholarship. Um, that's not what I want to do. That's not what I do. It's not what I care about doing. And I'm not good at it because I don't care about doing it. I mean, in theory, if I cared about it, Maybe I've become really good at it, but I don't want to do it at all. I'm not trying to write the art of computer programming and not at all. Like I wouldn't be happy if that's what came out. Uh, I just want, I mean, I have a lot of respect for that work. It's not what I'm trying to do. So I just have to be careful because, you know, I'm not trying to do the Knuthian thing as much as I respect that. So pre-writing and curating everything forever uh, isn't what I really want. So what do I want to write? I've been thinking about this a lot. So even in the last two days, I haven't written. I haven't really written. I've just been way, way, way too busy. And it's probably good to have a little break anyway. Um, but I'm still thinking about it. You know, so I think about this stuff on a regular basis. What am I? What do I want to do? So right now, there there are basically four works that I would like to do. You know, these this is sort of longer term. Um, Although maybe I do some work on on each one, I don't know. You know, it may be in some sense that if I do at least two things at once, that's better because if I get tired of one, uh, I can kind of swap to the other. Just like with the videos, right? You know, the videos have different topics. The R six R S videos. Well, when I was making videos of sound, I could switch between R six R S and Well Radio and you know, whatever else. I could talk about different macros. I could talk about different things. And if I got one bored of one topic, I could just switch to the other. And that, that was the writing technique um, of Ray Bradbury. You know, he'd always say that he had so many things going on and so many ideas, so many projects. If he ever got bored of writing about one thing, he could just swat, swip to, switch to something else. And as long as I manage that a little bit and sort of keep it to a dull roar, I think I can do that. You know, I mean, I had no trouble interleaving R6 RS with talking about other topics. Uh, I could pick up the R6 RS anytime. It's very easy, very little context. All the context is really in my head because I've been programming a scheme for a long time. Um, so I can imagine doing, working on a couple of these works, maybe all four of these at once. I don't know, four might be too much, but I could kind of play with it and see where I go. You know, I could just start these and see see where I vote with my feet or my fingers, if you want to think of it that way. So the four works I have in mind are, you know, the first one is what is mind-blowing, awe-inspiring, weird, or in the words of day nine, so stupid and so funny about relational programming. You know, so what are, what are those things? Um, You know, what, what are those types of things? I just want to collect those. So to me right now, that's the work I'm most inspired by. Just kind of finding those things and also pushing on those, you know. So, you know, collecting, collecting these, pushing on these. adding to these, you know, explaining them and, you know, possible directions to go. Challenges also, what are the challenges and possible directions? So obviously if I did a giant book on relational programming, it would have some or all of these things, but you know, it's more about what's the focus. So if we just focus on what are the things that make relational programming interesting enough, 
to make it a worthwhile endeavor, even if we can't do it very efficiently in most cases right now. So to me, that's what, what that first work is about. Um, it's more about like the inspiration and here is the mind blowing thing that you can do, or here are 10 mind blowing things you can do. And now we just need to make it work better so that we can actually do those things in practice. So you could think of it sort of like a Brett Victor demo, you know, where he had like the Mario figure and going backwards in time and, you know, videos like that, that inspire people or a mother of all demos type thing by Engelbart, you know, something where it's like, okay, this is something you give to people and focus their attention on what's interesting. And also, you know, create some energy and momentum around, okay, here are some things we could push on, you know, and here are some ideas about how we could push on it. Okay. So I think that's really important, uh, especially with something like relational programming, where we have a small community of people who are interested and very few people can work on this full time. I don't work on relational programming full time it's my hobby. I've never had any money to pay for any of my, like say research on relational programming. So anyway, I, I think that's uh, the sort of thing that's important. Um, that's one work. That's sort of the main thing I've been, and that's one reason I'm trying to do this curation and collecting things is that, okay, what are the examples that are really mind blowing? Or what are the examples that I think could be mind blowing if we push them? And then, you know, there'd be a combination of things we can already do, right? Writing about that. And then things that, that are cool ideas that we can't quite get working, you know, um, all those sorts of things. And part of it is I want to inspire myself and I want to you know, get myself working on these examples. So, you know, I find it boring personally to write only about things that, that we've done in the past. I want to write about some things that we're currently working on doing in the future. That's one work. Another work is everything I know about relational programming. And maybe that's a form of a big book. Maybe it's another form. Maybe it's a wiki. I don't know. But the idea is to try to record all the things that I know or think I know about relational programming or think are interesting or just thoughts about it, you know, just try to have kind of the massive brain dump, but I don't want it to just be a brain dump. I want it to be at least a little bit organized. Uh, but part of it is whenever I have a conversation with someone who knows a little bit of Mini Canrin and we start talking about it for, for real, start having an in-depth conversation every single time at the end, they're like, Oh, I didn't know about these 20 things. Uh, and to me, most of those 20 things are probably things that are so obvious. If you've spent a lot of time looking at constraint logic programming or mini Canrin, um, you know, there's just this kind of big disconnect between the things that people who are in the space work of work on and think about and know about um and the people who don't which makes sense i mean that's going to be true in every area but i think even just writing down all the topics and then having a little bit of explanation about okay this is what this thing's about here are some references to it here's why it might be interesting here's why it might be challenging you know those sorts of things uh, that's important because if you don't know those things exist, it might take you a long time kind of bouncing around in the world of all papers and so forth to try to find, you know, to, to, to stumble across these things that do seem interesting or do seem to have connections. Okay. It's not, not to say that I know everything about this stuff. Not at all. I'm still a beginner, but, um, but I have come across a lot of interesting things that are worth sharing, I think. So that's something I would just like to record, which is like the, the semi-organized brain dump of everything I know about relational programming or everything I've seen that seems interesting or promising or the connections to other types of programming. Just put put down everything, everything I can. Um, or, or another thing is the mini Canron language has changed enormously over time and the implementations have changed and their implementations in different languages of of many Cameron like languages and it's overwhelming to someone who's just trying to approach it. So 
Well, it's not overwhelming to me because I know all these different variants. Um, but I think it's it's quite common that someone, will, I mean, someone ran into this the other day where they were trying to do something with Mini Canron and they were trying to get the code to work between like a modern Mini Canron and an old Mini Canron. And it turns out they had accidentally stumbled upon the code on GitHub from the first edition of the Reason Schemer from 2005 where Condi, which is Condevery, uh, tries everything. Well, uh, we, the Condi from 2005, it does try every version, but it's basically a depth first search. Whereas there was Condi in the first edition of the book, which was the interleaving search, which is you know, sort of the modern way of looking at it. And for the second edition of the book, and for modern mini canrons, we've gotten rid of Condi, and now Condi has the same behavior as Condi that does the interleaving search. But if you don't know that, you've got two versions of mini canron, and they seem to work very, very differently. Um, and it's like, well, yeah, it's because Condi, we changed what Condi does. Um, so that's a sort of understanding, you know, just writing a little bit about the history and how things have changed and maybe having a chart showing um, the different syntax and different forms and different implementations and, you know, what they mean. Um, you yeah, know, I could write that down. I've had to tell people that many, many times and they're like, well, the things I have to tell people over and over and over again because they keep running into the same problems, um, partly because we haven't curated things well, all right, well, let me just go ahead and write all that stuff down. And, you know, it'll take a while, but like I said, this is a long-term project. Um, another thing I'd like to do is computation, a personal view. And this is, you know, sort of like the Ascent of Man by Brunowski or Civilization, a personal view or Cosmos or, you know, uh, Connections, whatever, you know, that kind of a thing. But, um, you know, obviously that's, a subtitle of an imperishable wonderland of infinite fun, which is uh, a relational view of computation. So that's kind of related here. Um, but I also have kind of a bigger thing, not just relational. Eh, I don't know. All of these ideas I'm constantly, you know, constantly bouncing around my head. Exactly. How do I want it to work? Um, by making this a project instead of a single book, I try, I'm trying to get past, uh, this fear of missing out, like this fear of missing out where, oh no, I'm writing this book, but then the book doesn't have everything I want or it doesn't have exactly the right the right focus, but then I've written a book that's so close that I can't write another book, you know. That's part of the problem of, of publishing with a publisher that wants to make money is that, you know, there there's this danger of cannibalizing your own work or if they've published another book that's like too similar, you know, Whereas if I'm doing CC by license, which I'm doing um, right now at least, then, you know, well, I could publish 20 books if I wanted to. I mean, for whatever your definition of publish is, I could write 20 books and those books could have all sorts of overlap and, you know, but they have different points of view and that's fine. Um, so anyway, I'm just thinking about that. And then, you know, this last project I've been thinking about for a long time, some version, and this feels big, is undergrad through grad through research for functional and relational programming, an extremely opinionated view. Um, sort of, okay, so you want to learn relational programming and functional programming to the point where you could do research. Starting from nothing, starting from not knowing any programming, and you want to go up to doing cutting edge research and relational programming, what would be the dependency graph? You know, like what would, what would be the minimum you would need to know? And sort of like that book, The Theoretical um, Minimum by Susskind. Um, you know, what would be the minimum you need to know in order to get up to speed where you could actually start doing research, reading the cutting edge papers, writing papers, going to conferences, communicating with, with people at that level? implementing these ideas. And once again, that feels like a big project to me. Although in some sense, when I think about, I mean, I guess there are two ways of, of thinking about this. 
if you think about, well, I got to include everything, well, then that's a staggeringly large project. But if it's, well, just have to include the th ideas that are absolutely necessary to get up to root speed on, say, relational programming and mini Kenrin with the idea that we'll give pointers to good resources for learning other things that aren't, you know, so you don't have to teach compilers necessarily. Good point to resources for writing scheme compilers, let's say. Um, so it doesn't, doesn't have to include that. It would just have to include sort of an overall program saying, okay, go take this compilers course online or go read this book and then do these exercises and then you'll you'll know the basics that you need to know. And then, you know, here's the next thing to do. So it could be sort of a, a course. That was actually one of the... Um, reasons for this series of videos was to maybe move towards doing that. Um, so I, I still want to do that, uh, but it's a big project, and you know I gotta I gotta think my way through that. And that's one where you know I, I've been uh, hesitant to start on that one. Mm. I don't want to do a really bad job of it. I'm okay doing a somewhat bad job of it that I can improve. I'm okay with doing a really bad job of it if I can improve it. The problem with making the videos as opposed to writing is that if I make a really bad video, it's harder to improve a really bad video in some way than it is to improve really bad writing. You know, I'm not the greatest at writing first drafts of things. Like I can write you know, very readable sentences, but I won't have the right tone, but I'm quite good at rewriting. And so if I, if I rewrite something five times, then I can get, I can get the right or a, a good pr perspective. I think <clears throat> usually if I, if I really put in the time and effort and concentration, which is hard, but I can do it. Uh, but with a video, it's different because I feel like if I record a video and record it, then you know, release it, then it feels like I'm starting over from scratch if I record it again. And it's, it's weird. Like I could write a first draft of something and then immediately rewrite it. But if I record a video and release it, it would feel weird to me to then re release four more versions of the same video right after each other, you know, like wait three days, re-record the video, release that, and then wait three days or two days and do it again. And by the fifth time, I've got the fifth version. And what do I do? Delete the others? I'm not sure. It, it just, th those feel like performances that are not amenable to um, editing in the same way. I guess that's the thing, right? It's like I can edit the writing and I can make little changes, whereas with a video, if I give a, you know, like, what would it mean for me to edit the talk, the most beautiful program ever written? I don't know what that would mean. I would, I think I would have to just give the talk again from scratch. And, you know, that'd be weird. Um, so there's something about the writing that I find more, more approachable. I guess if I cut it in the segments, like a Hollywood movie, and then I had, you know, a session where, uh, we get an audience, and how did you respond to the ending? Oh, the ending's too sad. You know, I could do that sort of thing, but I'm not not at all interested in that. So, uh, in particular, you know, there, there's one video. The video I made, it was on um, tutorial video on continuation passing style. It was like I don't know, four hours long or something. Uh, and a lot of people have watched that. And I think it comes up first or, or very early if you do a, a web search for continuation passing style or whatever, or continuations. And it's not like it's a horrible video, but what it was is me talking to people with effectively no prep for a few hours. Um, it's very meandering. And I felt like, oh, maybe the, the part where people go, ah, oh, you know, that happens like, two hours in or something like that. So, you know, I kind of feel like, huh, oh, I want to take the video down. Part of me wants to take the video down because it's a bad resource in some sense. But it does, as enough people have told me that, oh, okay, now I understand. 
you know, what I really want to do is create a better one, but that just seems like, I don't know, there's a, there's a, a fair amount of work for that topic to do it much better. I mean, I guess it wouldn't be hard to do it much better in terms of just being compact, but I feel like, um, you know, there's just a certain bar. I have to make it significantly better than that video to 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 worry about even making it or to, for that to make sense. So maybe that's just a problem with my attitude, probably. Probably should just go ahead and make... Yeah, I could try it. That could be an experiment. It's like I try making five videos on on continuations from scratch. Just do them from scratch five times and, you know, put them all up and... See which ones uh, kind of make sense, but yeah, know, maybe I'll do that. Anyway, uh, I, if I were to do this approach, probably the way that must make most sense would be working backwards in some sense, saying, saying okay, or for, first of all, probably the main thing would be coming up with a high level plan. Okay, so how would someone go around about doing this? What are the resources, you know? What is a plan of study using existing resources? And then to probably work backwards, I guess, and then fill in kind of the the very specific instruction that's sort of the critical path to get to the knowledge of relational programming and the, the, the researchy things you'd need to know. So that's a big project. And, and of course, when I say is an extremely opinionated view, it's because almost all of computing and almost all of programming language research, you know, wouldn't be covered. Be a little bit on type systems, for example. Um, you know, maybe some more, but you know, I, I'm not the person to explain everything about type systems. It's not, I'm not the person to explain everything about anything. I'm someone who can explain certain things that I think are interesting and how certain ideas are connected to my understanding. And then, okay, here is a a certain path through the space of computing and programming languages that I think is interesting. And, and even if you know or want to know about all sorts of other areas of computing that I couldn't teach you about or only know a little bit about, this is an area that I think is interesting and worth worth exploring. I can do that. It's not It's not an encyclopedia of computation. It is... Here is a slice that I find interesting that I could talk about. And even then it's it's big. I mean that's a that's a a lot to, you know. Basically the idea would would be if I took someone maybe who knows programming, okay, but they don't know the sort of maybe they have learned some Java or whatever. Maybe they've even worked in industry. But if they wanted to work with me doing research on Mini Canron, what would they need to know? Okay, so it's not just they need to know programming at the level of like, here's a for loop, here's a conditional. It's like, well, you can know all those things backwards and forwards and still have no idea of what would be necessary to do research at the Mini Canron level um, in this space or how to, how to write a research paper, how to give a talk or any of those things. How do you write a rebuttal uh, to a paper you've submitted, you know, how do you pick which workshops to, you know, there's a whole bunch of, of research skills in addition to, um, knowing how to program and also just different views of computation, different approaches. Um, so anyway, these are projects that I can imagine working on, uh, right now I want to collect the mind blowing things, but I might also start working on the everything I know about relational programming and just start getting things down crudely because I, you know, I'm always working with some people who are trying to learn relational programming. Uh, and right now I'm working with several people who are trying to learn relational programming at the research level. So even if what it is is just like a big brain dump where I describe, here are a bunch of topics, here's a little bit about each topic, here's some resources, here's why it might be interesting. Even if it's just 100 pages of that, because I'm pretty sure I could easily do 100 pages of that, that would probably be useful for people who are exploring the area, especially people who could have a conversation with me. 
You know, so here are a bunch of things that you may not know, know about or some connections I see. Yeah, so that's one. I mean, it takes me so long to work on something like that anyway. Every time I'm like, oh, here's a deadline for a workshop or a conference, and maybe I'll just record something like this. How long could that take? And it's like, well, <laughs> way, way, way longer even to get it in the crude form than I could possibly imagine. Um, so if that's something I just keep working on, that would be that would be good. So anyway, I, I suspect what I'll end up doing is um, working on at least two of these things, probably at least the first two, what's mind-blowing and everything I know about relational programming. Just starting to write that stuff down and... Uh, See, see where I get, but I, I'm getting impatient. I want to start doing real writing now. So, all right. Well, this is a, a long update, uh, but that's what I'm going to do. Hope you all doing well and uh, talk to you later. Hope to see you on Discord or you know, email or whatever. Bye-bye.